The following podcast contains advertisements. If you prefer a podcast without advertisements, you can sign up for our ad-free version at patreon.com slash lawfare. That's patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll get rid of the ads and we'll be very grateful. I think it's fair to say it is a pretty catastrophic failure on the FBI's part. And understanding why the Bureau didn't look at social media posts is part of understanding that catastrophic failure, because it's yet another example of how there was really evidence in plain sight that something bad might be about to happen and that the Bureau might need to start preparing for it and it appears to have just kind of whiffed by without anyone paying attention or taking it seriously. I'm Quinta Jurassic, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, July 29th, 2021. The attempted insurrection on January 6th is back in the headlines. This week, the House Select Committee investigating the Capitol riot began its work with its very first hearing, So for our Arbiters of Truth series on our online information environment, Evelyn Duak interviewed, well, me, about social media's role in warning of the riot. Specifically, we talked about an essay I wrote in Lawfare on the FBI's failure to examine social media posts announcing plans to storm the Capitol, and how FBI Director Christopher Wray's explanations don't hold water. So why do I think Ray has been misleading in his answers to Congress on why the FBI didn't review those posts from soon-to-be rioters? What about the First Amendment issues raised by the U.S. government refreshing your Twitter feed? What role is social media playing in the January 6th prosecutions? And what does that say about how tech companies should preserve online evidence of wrongdoing rather than just taking it down? It's the Lawfare Podcast, July 29th. The FBI, social media, and January 6th. Quinta, thank you so much for joining us. Well, you know, I'm I'm a big fan of the show, so it's really (laughs) exciting to be here. First time, long time? (laughs) Yeah, great. So let's let's set the scene a little bit. We are going to be discussing the FBI's failure to anticipate and prevent the Capitol riot, and we're talking right after the first hearing of the House January 6th committee. So can you give us a bit of an overview to start for where we stand on that investigation? Absolutely. So as you say, we are recording this on the afternoon of Tuesday, July 27th, and the uh, House Select Committee on the Capitol riot held its first hearing this morning, um, hearing from four officers, uh, law enforcement officers who were at the Capitol and many of whom were uh, wounded and attacked during the riot. So they really started off with a bang. This is after there's already been some pre-existing investigations in Congress. Um, as we're going to talk about, FBI Director Christopher Ray and other FBI officials have appeared before Congress as well to discuss how the agency failed to predict and prevent the riot. So we're we're sort of in the stage where there has been congressional investigation of this for a while, but it's now sort of really getting underway with the select committee. And I think it's kind of an open question whether the select committee will be getting into any of the issues that we're going to be talking about here. Great. So let's turn then to that previous testimony that you mentioned. FBI Director Chris Ray's testimony. So this prompted a 3,000 word lawfare piece from you, which is the basis of our conversation today. So what did Director Ray say and when did he say it? So I should start by emphasizing that some of those 3,000 words were block quotes. (laughs) (laughs) And I will, just to make it sound a little less forbidding to any listeners who might want to give it a read. It's very readable. It uh, (laughs) goes down easy. So great. So Ray uh, made a couple of comments in June, testifying before the House Oversight and Reform Committee and the House Judiciary Committee. Essentially what he said was that the FBI is limited in its ability to look at social media posts without having an investigation underway. And this is important, obviously, because as we're going to talk talk about, the Capitol riot was not something that was sort of planned in the darkest shadows and only 
you know, burst into public view on the day of. People were posting about it on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, on Parler, on Gab in the days and weeks and months running up to it. So part of why Ray is talking about this is he's being asked essentially by members of Congress, why didn't the FBI know that this was coming, given that there were all of these posts out there? You know, it's not something that you would need some sort of invasive, you know, surveillance technique to take a look at. It's literally there if you load up, you know, Twitter or Parler or something like that. And Ray's answer was essentially, well, actually, we have limited authority to load up Facebook or Twitter or Parler. Um, and what he said, and I will, I'll read one of the quotes because I think the specific wording is important. So he's asked here by Representative Eric Swalwell whether he believes the Bureau has the authority to monitor publicly available social media. And he responds, the answer to that is complicated. There are attorney general guidelines, and we can talk about that, all of which are geared toward protecting the First Amendment. With proper predication and authorized purpose, there are a lot of things we can do. But what we're not allowed to do is just sit and monitor social media and look at one person's posts just to see if maybe something will happen just in case. So he's pointing there to the attorney general's guidelines and the confusingly named uh, FBI Domestic Investigations and Operations Guide, which because it's such a mouthful, people usually refer to as the dialogue, and essentially saying under these these documents, these sort of guidelines that the FBI has to adhere to, we are limited in our ability to just boot up the internet and start trawling people's social media pages. And essentially, that's why or that's part of why we were unable to see the Capitol riot coming. Okay, great. So you have surfaced a lot of the issues that we're going to be talking about today. But just to keep setting the stage, and maybe this is a completely mundane or obvious question, especially in light of the hearing today, which made it clear, but I just why this conversation is important, why this is a very, it sounds like a highly technical thing. You know, you just mentioned two very technical guidelines about this and it's sort of some fancy language. So, but to set the stage for why this is an important conversation, why does it matter or not whether the FBI was booting up Twitter or not? It matters because it goes right to the heart of the question of why the FBI fell down on the job on January 6th, which I actually think is a really important question. The FBI, honestly, I think has really dodged public accountability for its failure on January 6th, and we can we can talk about that as well. But the Bureau, the sole document that they put out indicating that perhaps something bad might happen on January 6th was one document issued by the Norfolk, Virginia field office. I I have long been curious why the people in Norfolk, Virginia seem to be particularly prescient here, and I haven't been able to get to the bottom of that. But they appear to have been the only people who were keeping their eyes on the ball. There was nothing from the Washington, D.C. field office, nothing from FBI headquarters. Just to compare, I mean, the Bureau came out really in full force during the protests in Washington, D.C., where I live. During the summer of 2020, there there were internal documents that have been released from within the Bureau saying, you know, this is going to be like it was after 9-11. We need to be out there. We need to be protecting our country. In the advance of January 6th, absolutely nothing. And that is part of why the Capitol riot was able to happen, right? It's it's a law enforcement failure on the day of in that uh, Capitol Police and the D.C. Metropolitan Police Department weren't able to hold back the rioters and that the National Guard was delayed in getting to the Capitol in the first place. But it's also an intelligence failure in that all of these agencies and the FBI is really the lead agency here did not gather or did not pay attention to anything that might have hinted that something bad was going to happen on the 6th. And keep in mind, this is, well, the president of the United States is going around saying, stop the steal. Hey, you may want to come to D.C. on January 6th. It's going to get exciting. So I think it's fair to say it is a pretty catastrophic failure on the FBI's part. And understanding why the Bureau didn't look at social media posts is part of understanding that catastrophic failure because it's yet another example of how there was really evidence in plain sight that something bad might be about to happen and that the Bureau 
might need to start preparing for it. And it appears to have just kind of whiffed by without anyone paying attention or taking it seriously. Okay, so enough stage setting. In your eminently readable and not actually that long blog post, you come out (laughs) with guns blazing and say, Director Ray's explanation of the FBI's failure to monitor social media to look at all those posts on Twitter is deeply misleading. So why? Right. So this is the part where we need to start parsing the technical language a little bit. So what Ray is saying, as I said before, is that, um, and I'll, I'll just say the line again, with proper predication and authorized purpose, there are a lot of things we can do. But what we're not allowed to do is just sit and monitor social media. And I also think it's important to flag there is a Ray gave this testimony after testimony by another FBI official, then FBI uh, Assistant Director for Counterterrorism, Jill Sanborn, who said that the FBI could not do anything without an ongoing investigation. So what Ray is essentially saying here is we need to have started an investigation. That's what he says when he says with proper predication, and we can talk about specifically what that means. Or we need to have, you know, some sort of box checking exercise. That's what he means when he talks about authorized purpose. And we can also get into that before we just boot up social media. Like there, there are processes that we need to go through in order to load up Facebook. And so the suggestion there, I think, is sort of these are high hurdles that you can't just leap over. And that is what prevented us from taking a look at these posts because of the First Amendment as he flagged, which we'll we'll talk about the First Amendment later. We always come back to that in this podcast. But I think what's important to understand is that if you look at the documents that Ray is referencing here, the Attorney General's guidelines and the Diog, they explicitly say that FBI employees are allowed to just boot up the internet, as I've been putting it. The Attorney General's guidelines says, and I quote, for example, assessment activities may involve proactively surfing the internet to find publicly accessible websites. The Diog says, FBI employees are permitted to conduct proactive internet searches of publicly available information. So those both are statements saying, you can look at this, right? You don't need necessarily to check those boxes. The other part that I think is really important is that those hurdles that Ray identifies, the the requirement for an authorized purpose and predication, those are not as high as he is indicating. We can get into the specifics of sort of different levels of FBI investigations. It, It does get pretty in the weeds. But the short version is that an authorized purpose is not a very high bar. It requires under the Diog... Uh, a national security, criminal, or foreign intelligence collection purpose that must be well-founded and well-documented. That is it. One way to understand that is essentially it has to be for a good reason. You know, like you you can't just be looking up, you know, what your ex-boyfriend is doing. But it's not, you know, you don't have to come in with reams and reams and reams of evidence. The point of the FBI being able to look at Facebook is so they can start collecting those reams of evidence and decide whether or not they want to begin an investigation to start with. So long story short, if you actually look at these guidelines that Ray is referencing, which is what I did, they pretty much, they don't directly contradict him, but they do indicate a very different story about the FBI's authorities than the one that he was selling to Congress. So you just gave the example of a boyfriend looking up their ex or something. So just to sort of get an idea of how high that bar is, is a good purpose just not a bad purpose, like not stalking your exes? Or is it, (laughs) uh, do you need actually like a good purpose as in there is, you know, some affirmative purpose for doing what you're doing? So the, the definition is you need a national security criminal or foreign intelligence collection purpose. So I guess in one sense, it's you need not a bad purpose. In another sense, it's you need a good purpose because it has to be one of those things. Yeah, that very narrow category of national security. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Right. It is potentially pretty broad. And if you say we're loading up Facebook and you saw that, you know, your cousin's friend posted something about how he's, you know, getting his gun collection ready to drive to D.C., (laughs) I think that would probably meet the bar. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. That's what it's like here. 
Okay, so let's go back to the other hurdle that you mentioned. For the very few of us, I'm sure, in the Lawfare audience who are completely hypothetically, you know, I'm not at all part of this audience, not totally fluent with US law enforcement lingo, what is a predicated investigation? Excellent question. So to understand this, you need to understand that there are different levels of what the FBI how the FBI investigates. And at each level of how the FBI investigates, there are more and more invasive authorities. So essentially, as you scale up the invasiveness of the investigatory techniques, the more basis you need for using those techniques to begin with. So first off, we have an assessment. That's what you need for um, the authorized purpose. That's what an authorized purpose sort of will let you start. And an assessment, and I quote, may be carried out to detect, obtain information about or prevent or protect against federal crimes or threats to the national security or to collect foreign intelligence. That's again from the Diog. So pretty broad, right? As we've just established, uh, authorized purpose bar is not particularly high. So predication or a predicated investigation is the next step up. Predication is essentially the standard of information that you need to have in order to begin an investigation. So there are different standards within the box of investigation. You can have a preliminary investigation, a full investigation, an enterprise investigation. But the short version is that you start entering that space of an investigation if you have information or allegation indicating that, and I quote again, an activity constituting a federal crime or a threat to the national security has or may have occurred, is or may be occurring, or will or may occur. Once again, that is pretty broad, as you can tell. And to get to a full investigation, which allows uh, use of some more invasive authorities, you need to have what's called an articulable factual basis of the activity constituting a federal crime or threat to national security or so on. So again, it's not nothing. You do need to be able to show we think that this might have or might be happening, but it's not the highest standard in the world. Okay, so if I was to summarize what you've said so far, it would be something along the lines of this was an epic fail by the FBI and the explanation for why is complete hogwash. And so, Yeah, that's about right. <laughs> yeah. So I guess a question I have for you, you know, given that that's not a, a subtle critique, is why this pushback is happening in a blog post you wrote for Lawfare and not after Director Ray said those statements. Like in your post, you name, you, you lay out these statements that Director Ray had made since January 6 about FBI power here. I'm wondering if you have any theories about why there hasn't been more public or congressional pushback on those statements. Yeah, I mean, as you suggest, I sort of I wrote this piece because I was annoyed that there hadn't been more pushback. And I should also say I'm indebted here to uh, Tia Sewell and Ben Wittes, who wrote a previous post sort of noting how Ray had appeared before these committees and basically gotten off scot-free. It is really, really notable how FBI officials have appeared in front of these committees and sort of been questioned by both the House and the Senate about how the FBI did on that day. And there is no one who is really pushing back and saying, why did you fail to make these connections? Why did you not put this intelligence together? You know, what on earth are you doing? I think that the answer may be a political one. The Republicans on these panels have been more interested in saying, you know, isn't it true that the Capitol riot didn't really happen? Or if it did happen, it was Antifa. Or if it wasn't Antifa, it was actually good that the riot happened. Whereas the Democrats are more interested in kind of setting forward and establishing the fact that the riot did happen and it was really bad and it wasn't Antifa. And sort of in that partisan crossfire, the opportunity to actually dig into what on earth the FBI was doing and I think, uh, turn a justified spotlight on Ray for the Bureau's failures here and ask, you know, why did you fall down on the job is is kind of lost. I think that's a shame. I think that the Bureau deserves a lot more scrutiny here. And part of that scrutiny is that, you know, by pointing to the supposed limits on the Bureau's ability to look at social media, 
as part of the excuse for why they didn't do anything, Ray is able to deflect attention from the much bigger question of why the FBI didn't use the authorities that it had. And I think that that is a big question and it is not going to be a flattering answer for the FBI. I think that the answer probably involves well a number of things. One of it is that, frankly, the FBI is an organization that is overwhelmingly staffed by white conservative men. And there are questions in my mind about whether a staff of those demographics might have been less disposed to look critically at the political organizing of extremists who were also white men on the political right. Um, I think there also are really big questions about to what extent the Bureau, both on the sort of individual agent and analyst level and leadership, including Christopher Wray, were kind of cowed by Trump constantly pushing back at the agency. So, you know, to what extent was there a sense within the Bureau of, we actually really don't want to investigate this, we don't want to poke this bear, because Trump had repeatedly made an example out of Bureau employees who had investigated him during the Russia investigation, leading to uh, several of them being fired or removed from their positions. And because of those concerns, I don't think that the answer of why the FBI did not see this coming is going to be particularly flattering. And so it's very much to Ray's advantage if he can kind of deflect attention and kind of hide himself under the partisan back and forth that's happening. Okay, so I want to perhaps contradict myself a little bit earlier in the stage setting that we did, suggesting that the stakes of this conversation were extremely very, very high, and question whether we are placing too much emphasis on the need to monitor social media and how important that would or would not have been. And I think this is an important question for later when we come back to those First Amendment issues that you flagged and whether the FBI should do this regardless of whether they currently can or not, because if it's valuable or if it's not valuable, it probably weighs into that question as well. And January 6th was an obvious focal point for those that believe that the election was stolen. The certification of the Electoral College vote um, was obviously a, you know, a, a huge point in that myth. And that's why the president had planned a rally for that day. You mentioned yourself a number of the statements that the president had made. Some of those statements were on Twitter, but I don't think you really need to monitor Twitter to see the president's tweets. There's a good argument to be made that it would be great if the mainstream media didn't cover all of those tweets quite so much. It's hard to get away from those tweets. Like you, it, it, you kind of have to be, you know, putting your hands over your eyes to not see the ex-president's tweets. Well, not now because uh, of the great deplatforming. But there were lots of other statements as well. It wasn't just the president. Um, just Security has a great timeline of events and statements in the lead up to January 6th that show just how completely blatant this was. As you said, it was out on our regular social media platforms. This is not something that you needed Tor or any kind of tech savvy to be able to see. The Proud Boys had discussed plans uh, in 2020 on Parler, but that wasn't just, you know, sort of cordoned off and, and, and limited to pilot was picked up and reported in Fox News and the Washington Times. There were plenty of other statements at rallies encouraging people to fight and stop the vote. And so this was just sort of really out there. It's been reported that Parler itself had referred violent content on its platform to the FBI over 50 times in the lead up to January 6th. So even without proactively monitoring social media, these posts were just sort of being served up uh, to the FBI. And so let's just say you're wrong, which is something that I rarely do, and the FBI I couldn't monitor social media. What difference would that really have made? Like you yourself in the post write that to the extent that senior FBI officials are pointing to the guidelines as a reason for the Bureau's lack of action in advance of January 6, it's because the guidelines make for a useful scapegoat. Arguing that the rules prevented the FBI from looking on social media draws attention away from the other factors that led to the Bureau's failure. So does this matter at all? Like, does social media matter at all if the Bureau was just more generally being willfully blind to the warning signs? 
It's a fair question. And I mean, I think you can you can take the point that I made and turn it on its head and say, if the Bureau hadn't made these other mistakes and if it hadn't fallen down on the job in all of these other ways, maybe it's, you know, these supposed guidelines that prevent it from looking at social media or a failure to look at social media wouldn't have mattered. And yet this has become kind of the the pinpoint that I at least have have seized on in criticizing the Bureau because it's what Ray has seized on. I do think there is an element of a dynamic that we often talk about on this show where criticizing social media is sort of politically easier than criticizing other elements. Um, And here it's actually not a criticism of social media that members of Congress are making to Ray. It's criticism of Bureau's ability or failure to look at social media. But I think the dynamic is similar insofar as the alternative, say, for Democrats asking, why didn't you look at X, is to say, why didn't you look at, you know, what President Trump was saying? Why didn't you look at Fox News? And you might say, well, that's a harder question to ask in some ways. I think it's also it's a harder question for Ray to answer because one answer for why didn't you look at the president's tweets is he is my boss. It just raises a lot of really complicated questions in terms of how the bureau thinks about its own authorities and its own role in an environment where the the primary threat is actually the person who is the chief executive and therefore is in charge of the Bureau. And so it's kind of easier to pose a question to Ray that you can kind of nail him on by asking, well, why didn't you look at social media? Because Ray is obviously not beholden to, you know, a random proud boy or a three percenter or just, you know, a big Trump fan than he is to Trump himself. That said, I think you're absolutely right that focusing too much on the question of why the Bureau didn't look at social media means that we we are not asking some of the bigger questions that I'm sort of suggesting that we should be asking about why leadership in the Bureau might have been disinclined from investigating potential violence that was instigated by Trump. Okay, so apart from distracting from those other failures. One of the other reservations that we might have in talking about whether or not the FBI had the authority to monitor social media is the assumption somewhat baked into that question and, you know, somewhat sort of that might be implied by your extremely, you know, passionate argument that the FBI clearly did have uh, that authority is that they should have that authority and should have used it in this case. So let's talk about those normative questions a little bit. I'm proud of us that we got, what, 30 odd minutes into this podcast without talking directly about our frenemy, that that First Amendment. So you you yourself seem a little bit ambivalent about this in the post. You write that it's a good thing uh, for the dialogue to incorporate these First Amendment constraints. The FBI is still shadowed by its history of investigating political activists under Hoover. Can you unpack that a little bit? I think for a lot of people, what happened on January 6th is so viscerally painful and still so extremely raw that it's difficult not to think that law enforcement should have whatever powers it needed to prevent something like that uh, happening then and happening again. So what's your concern here? The reason I made the reference to Hoover is that I think that know, is sort of where a lot of people immediately go when they think about the Bureau. And I actually think that that is justified to some extent. That is something that haunts the FBI. I mean, the headquarters, unfortunately, is still named after him. And what I'm referencing there is the Bureau's activity during the second half of the 20th century, explicitly investigating and going after political activists on the left because of their political views. So that's the Quintal Pro program. And that is not something that we should want the FBI to ever do again. I know uh, uh, former FBI Director James Comey has talked about publicly about how this kind of shadow of Hoover and Hoover's excesses and sort of lack of constraint weighed really, really heavily on him during his time as director. And 
it's because of how COINTELPRO was uncovered and the outrage around it that the FBI, we sort of end up now in this situation where the FBI has greater constraints on it and has sort of taken into consideration in a way that it really didn't under Hoover constitutional concerns, like, for example, the First Amendment and all that good stuff. And that is the kind of the beginning of the long and winding road that ends up with the attorney general's guidelines and the Diag. That's obviously separate from the question of whether the guidelines and the Diag are sufficient in protecting uh, constitutional rights of people who might be under investigation. But I do think it's important to kind of set out that history. Then I also think it's important to note more recent history, which you you kind of touched on in making the point that, you know, January 6th is so brutal that it's very easy to say, well, we should just want the FBI to, you know, do whatever it can. I remember we had a really interesting conversation recently with Dia Kiali on this podcast where we talked about how there is a very real record in the last 20 years after 9-11 of the Bureau of American Law Enforcement using really invasive techniques on Muslim Americans. And that a lot of the discourse now around law enforcement and social media seems to kind of wipe that away and not think about it as a, a cautionary tale. And I do think Dia's point is well taken. That is a really, really important precedent here. And every time that, you know, we're thinking, well, why can't they just do X in order to, you know, prosecute or investigate the Capitol rioters? It is always a good thought experiment to say, okay, how would you feel about this if, you know, we were still under the Trump administration and the person being investigated was, you know, a Black Lives Matter activist or Muslim American or something like that. All that said, um, I think we can we can talk about why There are good reasons why the Bureau might want to look at social media. And I I do think that that is an important authority for all of the reasons that we've just identified. You know, you don't want the organization to be going in completely blind. And it is true that, you know, if I post something on Facebook, I've posted it on Facebook. Everyone can see it, right? That's sort of what the point of posting something on Facebook is. And so I think that's, you know, that's different than say, you know, looking at my Facebook direct messages without any kind of legal process at all. But the point is very well taken that these are authorities that should be taken seriously. And I would argue that looking at the attorney general's guidelines and the dialogue and sort of actually engaging with what they say is a way of taking it seriously because the alternative is adhering to what Ray says a little bit. Um, he, He sort of made this argument before Congress where he said, well, you know, maybe if we don't have the authority to look at social media in the way that we should, maybe we should look into that and maybe we should expand that authority. I would rather that we look at and understand what the FBI's authority actually is and whether or not they're using that authority before the Bureau goes ahead and gives itself additional power. Yes, well, that does seem like a necessary first step. But I do think that there are very legitimate issues here, both sort of normatively and constitutionally. And I'm perhaps going to take an unusual role for me now on this podcast, which is sort of more staunch uh, First Amendment rights defender. And this could be my bias coming through because this is a little bit of a sore point for me. This is slightly personal. So I'm actually in Australia right now, um, where I have just been given my liberty from two weeks hotel quarantine, uh, and I left to come home in a bit of a hurry and only belatedly realized that my student visa that I kind of need to finish my doctorate expires while I'm home. So I had to apply for a new one while I'm here, and one of the questions that I had to answer in my visa application is whether I have a social media presence, and if so, what my handles are. And that's at Evelyn Dueck for any listeners that have desperately wanted to follow me, but just haven't been able to work out how. And it's hard to think of a reason why the government would need my social media handles, except for the possibility of monitoring 
my social media or checking it out. And I'm fairly confident that they don't have a predicated investigation into me. And I won't lie, this this definitely has a chilling effect on me. I generally try to steer clear of politics when I tweet because there's this thing in the back of my mind that I never know who will be reviewing my visa application and I would really like to finish my doctorate, please. And, you know, there's a lot of discretion baked into the visa process. Um, I am just, you know, sitting here, they have my passport and at some point I'm going to be told yes or no and I'm not going to be given a whole bunch of reasons uh, why. And so, I mean, I think my social media is not going to be the bar, but, you know, in theory, you can see how that plays out. And Avoiding chilling effects is a pretty standard First Amendment concern, and indeed the Knight First Amendment Institute and the Brennan Center have filed a First Amendment challenge to the registration requirement in the visa application process, which is ongoing because the Biden administration has, um, in my opinion, sadly, decided to keep defending this Trump era policy, uh, and the, the policy itself has some sort of uh, rotten roots because it was part of the extreme vetting procedures uh, that Trump ordered as part of the the Muslim ban. Um, So this is a very sort of long roundabout and slightly grouchy way to getting to my point that the FBI monitoring social media, it's sort of being more clear on that authority and then establishing that that authority is unquestionable uh, would have chilling effects. And if, you know, maybe people aren't so concerned about the First Amendment rights of visa applicants or foreigners or, you know, cross-border speech, it's clear that Americans have First Amendment rights and hold them very, very dear. And so we may not care so much if the result is chilling people who are plotting an insurrection, for example. But as you were just talking about, that's not the only people that we need to think about in this context. And what, for example, you know, what do we think about it if just hypothetically the government of the day thinks that Black Lives Matter are terrorists? So do we really want the FBI just sort of clicking around on Facebook and and, and Twitter and asking visa applicant, you know, not, not a loaded question at all, Quinta, but, you know, is the government right to demand my handle? <laughs> I think surveillance is great. Um, no, in, in all seriousness. You never want me back. <laughs> exactly. No, if, if any employees of USCIS are listening to this podcast, please let Evelyn back into the country. Thank you. Um, uh, so a couple points here. First, I think obviously this is, this is absolutely a concern um, and it's one that I take seriously. I think that... One thing to note is that the standard for assessments and predications is not nothing. We've sort of been joking about it as not a particularly high bar to clear, but those standards are there for a reason. And the reason is that sometimes you just don't have an articulable factual basis to begin a full investigation, right? That actually does weed out a fair amount of stuff. I think it is probably, among many reasons, one of the reasons that the FBI, for example, never, as President Trump wanted, started an investigation into Hillary Clinton, because there are internal standards that say you can't just spin this up out of nothing. To, to point to Hoover again, there's uh, the, the letter that Hoover sends to the attorney general saying that they want to surveil Martin Luther King Jr. is about as long as I just described it. Um, It essentially says, we'd like to surveil this person. That's it. The standard for predication is not high, but it's also not nothing. And so I do think it does weed out some completely meritless material. The second point I want to make is that while I was writing and researching and reporting this piece, one of the things that I came across was a suggestion that Part of the reason the FBI may have really floundered here in not looking at the social media of the soon-to-be insurrectionists was actually due to confusion within the Bureau about where the lines were in looking at First Amendment protected speech online and confusion among Uh, FBI agents and analysts at sort of where something crossed the line into something that really did merit an assessment or a preliminary or full investigation. I think that that changes the discussion a little bit because we shouldn't want confusion, right? Because if people are confused, on the one hand, you might call it a, a chilling effect where they're they're hanging back from 
you know, documenting this or taking a look at these kinds of posts online because they don't know what oversteps the line and they don't want to overstep that line. But it also means that they could have a wrong interpretation of where the line is and might step over it when they shouldn't in, you know, some kind of situation. Um, I think that a much better situation would be one in which the FBI takes the time to make sure throughout the organization that agents and analysts have a correct understanding of what the Attorney General's guidelines and the DIOC and the First Amendment permit so that everybody knows exactly where the line is and what side of it they should be on. And that that kind of system will be much more protective than the sort of muddy setup that there may well be at the Bureau now, where people are sort of hanging back because they don't know what they can do. Let's say you're right that the FBI does have this authority, and I'm right that this is somewhat concerning or does raise legitimate First Amendment issues, and at the very least, we want to clarify those issues and the scope of that authority and where the big red lines are and should be. One of the things in thinking about this that strikes me is how very difficult it would be to challenge this kind of activity by the FBI. And I'm curious for your thoughts about whether you think that the First Amendment could ever constrain this sort of kind of action ex ante or whether it will only be ex post. So, you know, would we ever know the extent of law enforcement's monitoring of social media in advance or if they have crossed those red lines and sort of wandered into concerning uh, monitoring of protected First Amendment activity or whether that kind of thing is only going to come to light after the fact um, when the violation of those rights has already occurred? It's a great question. I find it difficult to imagine a situation in which someone would be able to successfully challenge this in advance just because the standing issues are so severe. I mean, as you pointed out, with the ongoing social media monitoring policy, you know (laughs) that they're looking at your Twitter handle, which is what is chilling you from posting certain things on it. Yes, it's it's very outrageous, controversial things that I would be posting. (laughs) Exactly. Um, You know, the the Knight Institute's uh, lawsuit over this identifies specific named plaintiffs who are saying, you know, our work is infringed because we're not able to you know, bring people to the United States because we don't know if something that has been posted on their feeds might create problems, right? On the other hand, if what a prospective plaintiff might want to say is, well, I think that the FBI might have been or might be looking at my tweets, that's pretty inchoate. And we already have some precedent under Clapper versus Amnesty International that that kind of potential injury doesn't really cut the mustard when it comes to standing. So I do think that that means that as far as I can imagine, it would probably have to be an ex post. Um, and maybe that that sort of amplifies the the chilling problem, right? Because you, if you can't challenge it, then you need to really, really be careful about what you're saying. Um, but it is hard for me to imagine how anyone could successfully get in the door on that. Okay, so I want to move on to some of the other social media issues implicated by the January 6 events and sort of law enforcement issues more generally around that and move from the idea of why law enforcement failed to prevent the events of January 6 and now how social media is playing a role in the events after January 6. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role that social media evidence, posts, tweets, ex- parlor, what are they called? I can't remember what we call them on parlor. Parls, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> there's a very obvious word, I'm just forgetting it. The role that social media evidence has played in or and is playing in prosecutions for those involved in the events of January 6th. So the answer is that it is playing a big role, which is maybe what we we should have anticipated. I will note, Evelyn, that this does not concern my favorite piece of evidence pointed to in a January 6th charging document, which is the fully constructed Capitol Lego set 
found <laughs> yes. um, in the living place of one of the defendants, this uh, which I, I love. Because I, in fact, have that Lego set. And I would just like to clarify that the Lego set would not be a very useful guide for anyone wanting to plan an insurrection. At most, it might help you identify which building you needed to go to. But even that, it's slightly questionable. <laughs> Well, which actually could be helpful because one of the defendants uh, said repeatedly that he was at the White House. So <laughs> there you go. But anyway, the, there are uh, repeatedly, if you look at the charging documents um, and the the filings by the government in these cases and the January 6th prosecution, social media comes up again and again and again and again. I took a quick spin through Ryan J. Riley's tweets. He's a reporter at the Huffington Post who's been really reporting these cases in great detail. So just... Some examples, Edward Lang, uh, who was one of the January 6th defendants, it looks like he posted on Instagram a picture of the Capitol with a arrow saying, this is me, pointing to where he was. On the evening of January 6th, he posted a selfie and said, I was a leader of liberty today. Arrest me. You are on the wrong side of history. Uh, there is another defendant who posted on Parlor. December 27th, 2020, uh, see you in D.C. on the 6th, assholes who don't support Trump on the 19th, you posted, we have got to get to D.C. on January 6th. It is imperative. Every single person that voted for Trump has to flood D.C. There's, it's really just endless. Quite considerate and helpful, really, uh, to be generating such a generous body of evidence. <laughs> There's, there's So there's another defendant, Jonathan David Lawrence, who posted on January 6th on Facebook, anyone here in D.C.? Someone responds, are you in D.C.? He responds, <laughs> yes, I'm in the Capitol building right now. So the, the evidence is pretty overwhelming, and I think it is very clear that it is a boon to investigators and prosecutors in these cases that it was so heavily documented. Uh, weeks and weeks in advance, and also after the fact that many of these people were in the Capitol and took selfies and videos of themselves while they were there. And it strikes me that this is just going to be the case for sort of all big investigations or public events from now onwards. Uh, social media is where we talk about things. It's where we have discussion. It's where we plan things, uh, whether those things are birthdays or insurrections. And so, you know, the role that social media plays in law enforcement, in judicial proceedings and prosecutions is going to be an ongoing issue. And I can't resist talking about the content moderation issues that this raises because, as I like to say, everything is a content moderation issue. And there's an interesting tension here between how social media posts have been used to find and bring cases against people involved in storming the Capitol and the way in which content moderation influences what's available and creates the possible universe of that evidence. And the overwhelming sort of conversation in content moderation circles about this issue is calls for platforms to take more stuff down and more quickly. And there isn't sort of this countervailing conversation about the role that some post might have in a prosecution, or if there is that that's not, in any event, we would say that's not a great reason for leaving up a post that is blatant incitement to violence. And so it does create an issue, though, of biases and blind spots in platforms moderation feeds in influencing what's available and what might get surfaced. It's possible, for example, that the worst and most obvious stuff gets taken down and disappeared by platforms, but the more borderline or difficult stuff to find is what's left over. Although based on the review that you just gave and the, the summary, uh, it seems like a lot of stuff was, was slipping through the net. And this is a huge issue that goes well beyond January 6th. As I said, it's come up a number of times and I'm sure it's just going to come up from now until eternity. And we should definitely dig into this more on future podcasts. So listeners, stay tuned, uh, stay with us. And it comes up in, in international war crimes prosecutions, for example. 
in the proceedings against Myanmar for genocide, there's this question of the evidence that Facebook has that the prosecutors don't have and Facebook's sort of responsibility to turn over that evidence, but also the privacy issues that it necessarily raises if law enforcement or prosecutors can just at any time ask social media platforms to turn over evidence. And there's been some really interesting ideas around what we should do about this, around the idea of platforms creating evidence law and preserving all of the stuff that they take down so that, you know, with uh, proper authority, if that is requested in the future, that they are able to, to hand it over this very important body of evidence. Zitrin, Bowers and Senberg have more excitingly called these evidence lockers poison cabinets and this idea that um, there's really bad stuff in there and it shouldn't be out in the open. It shouldn't just be circulating on social media platforms for anyone to sort of see and, and maybe be incited by, but it also shouldn't be completely disappeared. I mean, it's not just evidence, it's important historical artifacts and the historical record for how this occurs. And so I'm curious for your thoughts about how you see this playing out when it comes to to January 6th and how content moderation relates to, you know, that extremely large role that you just laid out of posts as evidence. The big question here in my mind has to do with the role of parlor. So as as we kind of discussed and joked about a little bit, the posts or parlors or whatever you want to call them, that the rioters put up on the website are turning into a real goldmine for investigators and prosecutors. I think the media organizations also have really been able to do a lot with them. ProPublica and the New York Times have published um, some really impressive investigations relying heavily on the media that was posted on Parler. But the interesting thing about Parler is, well, a couple things. So first off, as you flagged, uh, Parler says that it flagged for the FBI violent or concerning content and the FBI didn't particularly listen. But of course, that is itself interesting because Parler gained a reputation as being a place where you could post violent or disturbing stuff and it wouldn't be taken down because it was fashioning itself as, you know, the free speech platform, right? Right. So, you know, that these these posts in, in one way were available because Parler didn't want to moderate content, except that Parler, as most of our listeners probably know, went down after the Capitol riot because its service providers refused to continue providing service to it because they did not want to be associated with a website that was so closely linked to the Capitol riot. So Amazon Web Services pulled its service from Parler and the site went down for several days or a week, I think if I'm remembering correctly. That is an example of content moderation. And we've talked on this podcast about the sort of tricky role that service providers lower in the stack end up in when they decide that it's sort of come to a point where they want to pull services and kind of de facto moderate content in that way. But the reason that we have all these documents that were posted on Parler is that an enterprising person scraped all of the data from Parler, thanks to a vulnerability in its system, and uploaded it to the Internet Archive. And that is how all of these publications are accessing this material. And I believe also that it it may be how law enforcement is accessing it as well, although I, I don't know if that's been confirmed. So I think that is in itself kind of an interesting story about how this data is generated and destroyed and kept. Um, I don't know whether that makes the the file on the Internet Archive a poison cabinet <laughs> of, of sorts, but it is a really, really striking story that it's sort of because of the existence of this platform and the sort of shoddiness with which the platform was built and because one person decided to scrape the data that it exists at all as a resource. That, I think, is is striking and interesting. I mean, I think another interesting part of it is that a lot of the people who posted about this didn't seem to feel the need to delete their posts, um, at least not right away, which I think also speaks to the kind of shamelessness. Uh, I'm not sure what the right word is, but, you know, there there's not a desire to hide. There's a desire to broadcast. And so I wondered if that actually means that 
this situation is perhaps a little bit different from other situations in which people are trying to affirmatively hide evidence. Um, I mean, there's there's some really interesting stuff also in terms of how law enforcement in these cases, partially because of all these social media posts and parlor, is just drowning in evidence and is trying to contract with a consulting firm to basically build a database so they can access all this information, which the the courts have so far limited them from doing for grand jury secrecy reasons. So it strikes me that there, there's sort of a parallel there between how, you know, we talk a, a lot about how one of the problems of sort of our information age right now is that there's too much information and we can't figure out how to sort it and make sense of it, that prosecutors are actually having the same problem now with all of the material from the Capitol riot, which sort of makes sense given that I would argue the Capitol riot was in some part generated by that same sort of frenetic information environment that makes sense making difficult or even impossible. You know, I think one of the super interesting and important questions to my mind about sort of social media and content moderation in the next year or two is the role of these alt tech platforms and what happens. You know, Parler seems to be, by the way, just establishing our or trying to rescue our social media cred. um, They're called Parlays um, is is what a a tweet on Parler is. Parler seems to sort of be fading in relevance, but not necessarily. And there's a whole bunch of other platforms sort of popping up here and there. None have worked so far. Uh, Trump's blog famously flopped. But there's some very serious investors putting their money into this idea of creating an alternate free speech social network environment. And I don't know anyone that is very pro content moderation and more heavy handed sort of uh, taking things down that has a good solution or good idea about what to do with these platforms that not only are resistant to those calls, but proudly boast of not being in that vein. Their whole uh, value offering is that they don't do that. And for First Amendment reasons, the government can't mandate that they do that. And sort of public pressure has been the only way that we've managed to sort of get social media platforms to do any uh, more content moderation. And so I think that that's a huge issue for what happens in this environment going forward. I also think that, you know, one, I maybe undersold the role that social media platforms play in these public events. It's not just that they provide evidence, but in some ways these events are like content creation opportunities for people. It's not just that they sort of post things that become evidence. It's that they go to these events somewhat in part to create content to distribute on social media. And so it's a a sort of somewhat weird symbiotic relationship there and just more evidence of how social media has just fundamentally transformed our information environment more generally. What do you think happens next with the FBI and the authority to monitor social media? How do you think this goes forward at this stage? I think it depends on how much it comes up in the January 6th investigation, and we can talk about to what extent it's likely to do so. I do feel that if Congress doesn't push on this, I'm guessing that the Bureau isn't going to want to push on this either, which means that, you know, maybe we should rest a little easy that it's not like the Bureau is going to be granting itself, you know, expensive new authorities to look into things. But I also think it means that Ray's assertions may go unchallenged if the committee decides that it isn't a direction it wants to go in. So your blog post will be the full reckoning for Director Ray about his uh, flawed account of the FBI's failure. Well, you know, congratulations, I I suppose, for that (laughs) great honor. I mean, I I hope not, right? I hope... I hope that the select committee will do more investigation into this, or maybe if the select committee doesn't, that the other committees in Congress who are investigating will take a look. I think there's definitely a question of, you know, what the committees want to spend their energy on. And for all the same reasons that I talked about in terms of why I think the FBI has dodged attention, there's definitely a question in my mind about whether or not they're going to you know, be able to dodge the attention of the committees that are currently investigating. You know, congressional staff, if you're listening to this, consider it a, a call, a plea to take a closer look. Um, I really do think that 
part of having a more complete understanding of January 6th has to involve digging into why the FBI failed here and how it failed. And to some extent, although not completely, that has to involve a look at its failure to take a look at social media. All right. I think that's a good place to leave it. So Quinta, thank you so much for joining us. Always a pleasure to be on. You've been listening to Arbiters of Truth, the Lawfare Podcast's miniseries on our online information ecosystem. You can find past episodes in the Lawfare Podcast feed, and we'll be back with another episode next Thursday. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. Our audio engineer this episode was Ian Enright, and our producer is Jen Pacha Howell. Please rate and review the Lawfare Podcast on whatever app you use. And thanks for listening. ACAST powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. Hey, this is Jane Huger, host of the Young Turks, part of TYT's podcast network. We're the world's most popular progressive news show online. Not a big deal, I'm just saying. And we deliver an uncensored, unapologetic version of the news you won't get anywhere else. And that's really true. You should definitely check it out. So listen to the Young Turks on the ACAST app or wherever you get your podcasts. ACAST, 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 ACAST recommends. recommends.